my name is Christy Dentry and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. I will be your host today. Valley to Vietnam is a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America, Sacramento Valley Chapter 500. It is our intent to trace the arc of experience between Sacramento and Vietnam for our local Vietnam era veterans. Joining us today is Bob Tribe. He served in the Army from 1966 to 1969 with the majority with the 6th Special Forces Group. Thank you for your service and welcome. Thank you very much, Christy. Let's start from the very beginning. You okay. were born in Utah, yes. eventually moved to Idaho, then Chico, California, and ended up in Sacramento around the time when you were in middle school. Correct. You attended El Camino High School and from there went on to San Francisco State and started graduate school. Can you tell us a little bit about how you joined the Army? Well, you know, at that time we had the draft and every young person had to kind of compute that into their future. Uh, a lot of guys were joining the National Guard since the National Guard at that time didn't go to Vietnam, unlike today. Um, a lot of people extended into graduate school or lawyers or whatever, but we all you know, thought about being drafted and the, the numbering system hadn't come out yet, so you didn't have lower height draft, it was just a shake of the dice. And I had started grad school not that serious about it, but just had no other plan as to what I was going to do. I dropped a few units and my classification went from uh, 2A to, which was a 2S, I mean, which was a student deferment, to 1A. And I was notified that I was going to be grabbed pretty soon. So Christmas of 1965, I went to look at my options. The Army was three years, all the other branches of service were four, and I'd always had kind of a leaning towards the Army because my father was in the Army. And so I signed up and just said, let me finish this semester, and I went in in early April of 1966. Could you tell us how you spent your last couple months in Sacramento before deployment, and what spots did you frequent locally? Uh, drinking a lot and chasing <laughs> a lot of women. Uh, I just decided, you know, we could all be killed in Vietnam, so let's live it up. Uh, I moved back to Sacramento from San Francisco and went to a lot of dances at American River College and Sac State, um, hung out at Sam's Hofra, uh, which was a great place to meet you know, women and um, drink beer. And um, It was a blur, but <laughs> I tried to pack in as much as I could before I went in the Army. So let's fast forward to April of 1966, and you land in Atlanta, Georgia, before you're bussed out to basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Could you describe for us your first breakfast in the South? Yeah, that was kind of amusing because there were 11 of us who left out of the Oakland airport all the way back to Atlanta, Georgia. All of us were signed up to go to officer candidate school. So all of us had graduated from college. Um, we were programmed to go to through certain schools at certain times, so we were going to stay together, the 11 of, of us. Of us. Um, and we sit down, we'd been flying all night, we sit down in this host restaurant in the airport, this waitress with a very strong southern accent, which was very alien to me, <laughs> uh, I almost needed an interpreter, um, and she said we all, all ordered breakfast, it was about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, and so we order eggs, and she said, with those eggs, you want grits or taters? And I said, what are grits? And she <laughs> said, boy, you some sort of Yankee? And uh, that was kind of amusing. And little did I know I would have grits every day of my life for the next three years. So you had eight weeks of basic training at Fort Jackson where you met your best friend, Ron. Could you go into a little detail of what it was like being an E1? Oh, my God. It's like not the most pleasant experience. I mean, I've been in grad school. Uh, going to toga parties and uh, you know just having a good time and really didn't have to study that hard. Um, life in San Francisco was great, um, especially for men because there were a lot of women looking for straight guys. Um, so now you know they shave off all my long blonde hair. Uh, they put me in this baggy uniform. We really look like total geeks. <laughs> um, they start hitting us with all kinds of shots. We've probably got 10 or a dozen shots that give them to us in both arms. Uh, and everybody, someone's screaming at us the whole time. It was kind of 
funny because as we bus from Atlanta up to uh, Fort Jackson and outside of Columbia, South Carolina, here's this big sign, welcome to the U.S. Army. And so I thought, oh, geez, it's going to be a real nice greeting. <laughs> Wrong. Um, so it was just getting used to discipline, which was new for a lot of people. Um, we had a week or two in the reception area where before we started our training, they just put us doing kitchen police and guard duty and picking up cigarette butts and everything you can name. Uh, someone screaming at us all the time and dropping us for push-ups. Um, and this kid from Kentucky didn't know how to write. And he had these letters from his girlfriend, and so he asked me to write the responses. Wow. I thought, wow, people who don't know how to write. That shows what the quotient is right now, you know, for cannon fodder. Um, but for me, I just thought it was a great experience. We had a whole one whole platoon that was all Puerto Rican, and they most of them didn't speak any English. So, you know, many of us tried to help them out to understand what they were being screamed at about. Right. Um, I thought of it as sort of a giant sociological experiment here are all these people with all these varied backgrounds and I could learn something from that and I did. And many of those people who went through OCS with me are still my friends today. After eight weeks of basic combat training, you stayed for an additional eight weeks for advanced infantry training and then went on to Fort Benning, Georgia for officer candidate school for the next six months. <coughs> True. Training was very rigid. Oh boy. And could you please describe for us a typical day at OCS? Nothing was more intense of all my training than OCS. It was just um, incredibly tough. And the whole idea was to try to wash you out um, because you were potentially all going to be infantry officers at some point, And they wanted you to be under stress. And it was just, <laughs> I found it amusing some, sometimes, you know, the cruelty that some of these folks could come up with. It was just. Uh, and I got in trouble because I would uh, kind of laugh at times or smile, which was as bad as laughing, and get in trouble. But, you know, we'd get up every morning at 0500, that's 5 o'clock for you civilians, <laughs> um, and we would do um, physical training. We'd do calisthenics and all the other things, burpees and push-ups and sit-ups and all that sort of thing. And then we would go to breakfast, and then... Um, I think I had that reversed. We'd do running before breakfast, and then we'd have breakfast, and then we'd do all these calisthenics so that you could throw up breakfa breakfast if you chose <laughs> to. Um, but it was, you know, you were either going to be in the field all day or you're going to go to classroom. You ran everywhere. Um, your only response to any infraction was no excuse, sir. Um, didn't matter if your mother was run over by a bus, if you were late for know, getting the call and you were late for formation and your ex excuse was still no excuse, sir. Um, I mean, the most uh, incredible thing to me was every meal. And we only did this till we were senior candidates, so we only had to do this for 18 weeks. Uh, the whole OCS was 24, but we would stand at attention uh, in front of the mess hall and then we would, you know, come to parade rest, which was your hands behind your back and your feet apart, and just move to attention as you went up. You were not allowed to eyeball, speak, uh, show any facial expression. You did pull-ups before every meal. There was a pull-up bar in front of the doors. You walked in and the TAC officer would be there trying to get you to eyeball him or look at him or whatever, so you had to just stare dead into space. You grabbed your rectangular plate and your silverware and you had your food put on your plate and then you were at a four-man table. Now it's a four-person table in today's army, but um, you had to ask permission to be seated and then you sat down and they had tape on the last, uh, right after the first four inches of your chair, the end of your chair, and you were sit down and your pants, your trousers should not blouse out beyond that white tape or that was an infraction, you were thrown out and you didn't eat. Um, and then you ate at attention at the end of the chair like this, with your arms at your side, your fork and spoon were at 90 degree angles to the plate, and your knife was at a 45 degree angle, and so you would take a bite like this, replace your utensil, put your arms at attention, and chew your food. 
And then, you know, any little thing, they could just mess with you and say you did something when you didn't. I, at one point, had to stand on top of one of the mess tables and pretend like I was a helicopter. <laughs> and I had to take off my dog tags and troll them around my head at attention. And another guy stood behind me, bent over like this, and he pretended like he was the tail rotor with his dog tags. And we had to sing the alma mater of Fort Benning, which was something about far across the Ch Chattahoochee to the shores of the Yupatoy, blah, 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 blah. The whole idea was to build discipline. And, and you were in the field a lot. We did, you know, night maneuvers. We learned how to use explosives. We used every, c we fired every kind of weapon there was. Had to qualify with all those weapons. Um, we rolled. We went through swamps in the middle of the night. Uh, we did the Benning phase of Ranger training as part of OCS. And so, we, I forget the number of hours, but uh, it turned out to be 20-hour days. So the most you were going to get was four hours of sleep, and we never got four hours, and we did that for about 10 days. And so it was intense, but I kind of liked the challenge. Um, it was, you sort of felt once you finished this that you could do anything. Could you explain a little bit about the structure in your bunk, how clean everything had to be and how neat and tidy? Yeah, I, the, you saw that one photograph I showed you of our floors. The floors were in horrible shape and there were these big dark brown tiles. <coughs> we had to clean the floors and then we would take bowling alley wax and we had to take diapers and hand spit shine the floor. So we had to put several layers of the wax on the floors. Uh, we were never allowed to wear our boots inside the building so we had a, a kind of rubber strip down the middle of the hallway. This was a huge three-story building that would house 300 people. Um, and then we carried uh, placemats on our little clipboards and we'd have to come in on our stocking feet and then throw the placemats around the edge of the room. You have a photogra photograph, I think, of Ron and I, my roommate, sitting on, you know, I think our foot lockers, which were on blocks and underneath the blocks we had Kotex. Underneath the blocks on the bed, the bunk bed, we had Kotex and everything did not ruin the shine in your floor. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, your drawers, the drawers in your cabinets had to have, the first, first drawer had to be out two inches, and if it was two and a quarter, then you got demerits. Next one, that would be out like four inches. Next six, the last eight. And inside each one of those drawers were prescribed pieces of gear that you would wear. For instance, you'd have four folded undershorts and they better be in a six by six square, not six and a half, not six and a quarter, not five and three quarters, because they'd come in with a ruler and measure these things. Mm -hmm. And then periodically, you'd have to take these things if they gathered any dust and kind of dust them off and reform them so you're always measuring this stuff. That was a little ridiculous, because you never wore that gear. It was just there for display. You know, everything mm -hmm. else was in your foot locker. So our uniforms, we had to tailor all our uniforms and the starch in them was so heavy, you could barely punch your fist and your legs. You know, it was easy, <laughs> little le easier with the legs because the legs are stronger, but you'd be punching your arms through these starch fatigues. And of course, if you know what George is like in the summer, um, you know, you <laughs> wear those out pretty quickly. So at OCS, you signed up for four specialty schools, including military police training, ranger school, jump school, Jump Master School and Special Forces. Could you go into detail describing your jump school training exercises <coughs> and perhaps a jump that didn't go as planned? Well, I had several jumps that didn't <laughs> go as planned, to tell you the truth. You know, it was a big experience for me because I filled out the questionnaire, you know, before the physical for, for jump school, and I thought I was in really pretty great shape, and I was. But I put down, I, I get motion sickness, and I'm afraid of heights. And I remember this little, you know, medic who was like a e E4 or something like that. He says, now, why would you want to go to jump school? And I said, well, you know, my father went, and it just seems like it'd be fun. And he said, okay, well, good luck. Um, but once we went to jump school, we just did uh, two or three weeks of training where, you know, you would jump, you'd be towed up on a 250-foot tower, which are, I think, a photograph that we have. And released. 
you jump out of these 35 foot towers that with a harness and then fall about 15 feet to get the feel for uh, what it's like when your chute opens. Um, we would be in harnesses with a pulley on us and um, someone would just, one of the sergeants would just release the rope and say, prepare for a right PLF, which is a parachute landing fall. We got so that if you fell out of bed at night, you would automatically do a PLF. You know, <laughs> it just ingrained in you because we had to do so many. And if you did them wrong, you had to do them over and over and over again. Um, when we got there, there was a famous colonel who was in charge of jump school. And, and he took all the officers aside and said, look, there's going to be several hundred people going through this uh, class. You officers better be able to do more push-ups, run longer, run harder, do everything better than the enlisted men. We pushed ourselves hard, but compared to OCS, it was a joke. And then it culminates with five jumps. Mm -hmm. And um, so at one point, um, we're jumping with big boxes like this that had uh, bazooka round, rocket rounds in them, big thick wood with big rope handles, and they put two sandbags in these things. And you're just bent over and can barely get into the aircraft, and so instead of jumping out away from the plane, uh, you have a steel helmet on, everybody would just bounce off the side of the plane. you just hear bonk, 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 <laughs> like this. You know. um, and um, the sergeants are down on the ground on the drop zone and they've got bullhorns and they're telling, giving direction to people and they're yelling at this one fellow, you know, you're pulling the wrong slip, which means, you know, if the wind is coming this way, then, and then you pull on this side of your uh, uh, suspension line, you're going to catch the wind because what's going to hurt you is the lateral speed. Mm -hmm. You know, you're only going to drop about 15 feet per second. Um, still pretty hard. Um, and they're yelling at this one stupid guy, you're pulling the wrong slip. I said, what a dope. Well, it was me. And I was just <laughs> going, you know, I hit and flipped up in the air and slammed down and, and beat the hell out of me. But you never went on sick call because if you did, then you had to start all over again and go through all that stuff. So, But later, after I started, you know, assigned to an airborne unit, I had much more exciting parachute stories uh, that happened at that point. So after jump school, you're assigned to Special Forces in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And this is ironically where you were conceived. Yeah, my mother and dad were there back in 42. So could you tell us a little bit about your father's service and then about your day-to-day -day duties as an intelligence officer? Okay, sure. Um, my father actually joined the Army before Pearl Harbor or was drafted. Uh, in the Army in early 1941, and he just figured, you know, he'd do two years and be out and fine, and then Pearl Harbor happened, of course, so he was in five years. Um, but he was initially, he tried to get into the uh, 10th Mountain Corps because he was a big-time skier like everybody in Utah was, but he ended up in the 82nd Airborne Division, which was, in my estimation, even a better outfit. Um, so he actually served in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, uh, went into Normandy and gliders, went into Holland and gliders, um, was wounded three times, uh, got two bronze stars and a silver star, um, was quite the hero. And I was born in 43. I didn't see him till after I was two, but I always felt very lucky that he came out of that alive. Right. Um, he was a great dad. Uh, I looked up to him. As far as the intel officer thing, um, I initially was the assistant assistant group intel officer. And a group is kind of like an army battalion, so it's several hundred uh, special forces troops in three big companies. Um, and we had three companies, a mountain company, desert company and a jungle or swamp company. And each one of those companies would train in that environment around mm -hmm. the country. Um, so as the intel officer, um, well, the six special forces group had an area of the, the world that they were responsible for. And since the six doesn't exist anymore, I can tell you that was the Near East. We had from Egypt 
all the way to what is now Bangladesh, but used to be Eastern Pakistan. So I would get daily reports from the CIA, DIA, which is Defense Intelligence a Agency, the Atlantic Fleet, Naval Intelligence, and other agencies. And my job was I had intelligence analysts who were senior uh, non-commissioned officers or NCOs, and then they would determine what's important, what I should be looking at, because I would do daily briefings to the senior staff on what was going on in, in you know, Egypt or uh, Iran or India or Pakistan or whatever. And then I would get questions, you know, from the senior staff. And if I couldn't answer them then, then I told them I'd give them an answer by the, that day. And uh, then we would conduct training exercises. Uh, we would write the intelligence portion of those training exercises. And we'd go to, well, we went all over. We went to Alaska, we went to Arizona, went to Utah, went to Florida, Virginia, Alabama. Um, you name the place that simulated one of those environments and we would go and then we would do extended exercise. I've spent seven weeks in the Florida swamps on mm. one, one of those exercises. <laughs> so. In 1969 you were discharged and you returned to Sacramento to pursue a career first with the Riots and Disorders Task Force and then with the Fair Political Practices Commission until your retirement in 2000. However, your connection to your fellow officers at OCS was great enough to start planning class reunions. Um, you ended up doing 10 reunions between 1988 and 2011. Um, could you tell us a little bit about those reunions and some information that you found out about your fellow officers? I had a yearbook that had their first names, middle initial and last name for everybody that graduated from OCS, and most of them did because they needed you know, second lieutenant. We washed out probably 50 people or so out of our class. Um, and I wanted to find these things. And I wanted to find them for two reasons, just to get together with them again. And two, I wanted to know who was killed from our class and I wanted to honor them in some way. So I came here and started looking at phone books. And I would call somebody who might be related to them and they would connect me to that person. And uh, then as I found guys, I enlisted their aid in finding folks. So three of the guys were now FBI agents, so that mm -hmm. was helpful. <laughs> um, and one of the guys was really tight in a lot of uh, military organizations, so that was helpful. So we, then I sent out, I developed a questionnaire that essentially asked them, where were they assigned after OCS? Because they typically wanted you to get six months of command time before they sent you overseas. Um, and did you go to Vietnam? If you went to Vietnam, who were you assigned to? Were you wounded? Were, were you awarded uh, any medals that we should know about? Um, and did you see anybody from the class when you were there? And if so, where? And then what have you been doing since that time? So I still have this compendium that's about this thick. Mm. that I'd love to write a book about because uh, so many of these people have fascinating stories. So we met for the first time in um, 1988 in, in Las Vegas. And what I did is I, the list of the creation of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was in a book and there was an appendices that said, here are all the 58,000 war dead. So I memorized the 180 guys from our class knew their all their last names and I just went through that by hand mm. and then I figured out who had been killed and luckily only seven guys from our 180 person class were killed but about half the class took branch transfers out of the infantry so that greatly increased their chances of surviving. I sent all these kind of non uh, compilated editions of this questionnaire to Las Vegas, and I just kind of turned it into kind of a team building exercise to put these things together. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if people were going to, they hadn't seen each other in 20 years in most cases, whether they were going to talk for 15 minutes <laughs> say, well, that was nice. I think, oh, please let this work. And uh, it was fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, the hardest part, was once I found out who was killed, I um, called their parents, who were, they're mostly gone now, the parents that is, but, um, and uh, 
I talked mostly with the moms. That was really tough. At that first reunion, I said, okay, I'm gonna, s I'm gonna stand up now and I'm gonna tell you guys how each of these guys was killed. I'm not gonna get through this. It took seven of us. I believe it. To lead the seven eights. As we wrap up this episode, um, could you tell us what you gained most from the military? Wow. <laughs> well, it didn't completely uh, get me over my fear of heights. Um, <laughs> uh, and rock climbing later, I didn't either. Um, but it got me m over my fear of jumping out of airplanes and climbing big rock walls. Um, you know, it, it, it gave me a lot of things. I, I always say I got more out of it than they got out of me. Um, I got a lot of confidence in myself. When I first went in the Army, I thought, oh gosh, all my friends are going to be in graduate school or gaining you know, experience in jobs, and here I am going in the Army. Well, you got better experience in the Army if you, know, if you got into some challenging field than you could ever get in civilian life, in my opinion. I mean, where does a 22, 23-year-old uh, guy suddenly you know, is in charge of people, in charge of their lives, um, and in charge of complex, top secret uh, sort of things with a lot of responsibility and a lot of pressure on you and you have to perform. I don't think that happens that much or did, you know, with my generation at that level. You were typically thrown into some, you know, nobody job mm -hmm. and then had to kind of gain that. Um, so, and it also go, got over me. I had a terrible fear of public speaking and my first job once I came out of the Army was really talking to boards of supervisors and city councils and, you know, uh, community groups, and I never could have done that without being forced to give briefings all the time and, you know, answer a lot of technical questions. So I came out thinking I could do anything. I really couldn't, but I felt that <laughs> way. So, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful experience. I'd do it again in a minute. Well, that concludes this episode of Valley to Vietnam. I'd like to thank Bob Tribe, our guest, for being here, and I'd like to say welcome home to him and all of our veterans. For Valley to Vietnam producer Jerry Ward, director James Scott, and I'm Christy Dentry saying farewell, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Valley to Vietnam. Mm -hmm.